Hello and welcome everyone. Today we'll be discussing the role of bicarbonate, that is sodium bicarbonate, in critically ill conditions. So the goal of intensivists in metabolic acidosis is to restore the patient's physiological balances as soon as possible, typically by identifying and treating the causes of these physiological alterations. So the alteration that we are discussing right now is the acute metabolic acidosis. It is common among critically ill patients with complex mechanism, making it very difficult to identify the exact mechanism. Often leads to shifts in focus from treating the cause to correcting the pH. It is defined as a combination of low pH and low plasma bicarb. Severe acidemia is defined as pH less than 7.2. The incidence of metabolic acidosis in ICU patient ranges from 14 to 42 percent, while severe metabolic acidemia has 6 percent incidence. However, it has a very high mortality that is 60% around. So the detrimental effects of acute metabolic acidosis are it impairs the cardiac contractility, systemic vasodilatation and pulmonary vasoconstrictions, arrhythmias, cerebral edema, diaphragmatic dysfunction, energy failure, impaired immune response and the common causes of metabolic acidosis are lactic acidosis, ketoacidosis and renal failure. The other causes are loss of enteral fluid and saline administration or any poison. So the treatment considerations that come are the intravenous bicarb which is commonly used in these cases to improve the acidosis and reverse the pathophysiology. Bicarb administration is particularly intended to counteract the cardiovascular effects. Potential physiological consequences of bicarb administration are increase in the hemoglobin oxygen affinity that is the Bohr's effect, hypercapnia, hyperosmolar state and low plasma calcium concentration, increased glycolytic pathway and lactate production, possible role in preventing AKI after contrast medium use, cardiac surgery or liver transplant. So we have two main acid base theories or the approaches. The first and the one that we commonly use at the bedside is the Anderson's Hasselbalch equation which focuses on the concentration of bicarb and carbon dioxide. This balance is maintained by the lungs and kidney. It describes how the kidneys absorb the bicarb and secrete the hydrogen ions to maintain the acid-base equilibrium. It is primarily descriptive and does not really quantify the metabolic acids other than the carbonic acid. It introduces the concept of base excess to assess the metabolic acidosis or alkalosis. Although this limitation is there because it is an in vivo thing. Uh, the next more scientific approach is the Stewart's approach. It is a physical chemical approach based on the electrical neutrality where all cations and anion concentration must balance. It identifies three important determinants of the pH that is the carbon dioxide, the weak acids and the strong ion difference. The metabolic acidosis is linked to the decrease in the strong ion difference caused by factors such as organic anion generation and loss of cations or increase in the anions. The methods emphasizes the change in the pH of the carbonic acid occurs only in this independent variable changes. It provides a quantitative framework that integrates the acid base with the electrolytes, helping to explain conditions like hyperchloremic acidosis, hyperlactatemic acidosis. So the metabolic, the, uh, the Stewart's method advantages are it unifies the understanding of acid base with electrolyte, offering a more holistic approach. And uh, coming first to the acute respiratory acidosis and mechanical ventilation. Does bicarb have any role in this? In patients with ARDS, mechanical ventilation is commonly used to improve the gas exchange and reduce the work of breathing. And mechanical ventilation can lead to ventilator-induced rung injury, prompting the use of strategies to reduce the mechanical ventilation to remit the lung injury, that is permissive hypercapnia. The effects of hypercapnia and acidemia. It is unclear whether the acidemia because of the hypercapnia is having any harmful effects. Soda bicarb is commonly used in clinical practice to buffer the acid, though the evidence supporting it used in this context is not really definitive. The research findings show that a seminal RCT on lung protective ventilation allowed the use of bicarb in the presence of acidosis, that is respiratory. Despite its use, it did not raise the arterial pH with reduced and constant mechanical ventilation. Instead, it increased the carbon dioxide levels, which was expected. Sodium bicarb administration was also associated with reduced arterial blood pressure and cardiac output. And 
there was paradoxical acidosis. The respiratory acidosis involves change in both intracellular and extracellular pH. The use of soda bicarb can potentially worsen the intracellular acidosis due to the paradoxical effects where the carbon dioxide generated because of the bicarb freely diffuses into the cell, exacerbating the acidosis within the cell. So this is exactly what is expected if you follow the Stewart's approach. If this scientific approach would have been followed, this particular study should not have been done because it doesn't make any biochemical or physical sense to do such a study. The next is the Stuart approach to soda bicarb administration. The soda bicarb raises the pH not by directly adding the bicarb buffer but by increasing the sodium relative to the chloride. Now the bicarb in aqueous solution behaves as a weak acid existing in equilibrium with carbon dioxide which can diffuse into the cell potentially worsening the intracellular acidosis. So the clinical use of the soda bicarb despite the weak rationale is limited to conditions where this can be achieved that is sodium increase can be done. So it is mostly done in severe metabolic acidosis. So what is the evidence that we have? A prospective study of 1700 patients with sepsis and acute metabolic acidosis found no improvement in outcomes to those who received bicarb in the first 24 hours. Uh, multicentric RCTs have shown that uh, critically ill patients with severe metabolic and mixed acidemia showed no difference in vasopressin need, the ventilation duration and mortality between the, those treated with bicarb and those not. Another trial with uh, 400 patients found that early bicarb infusion did not reduce the 28 day mortality or the incidence of organ failure except for decreasing the need for RRT. So what are the potential side effects of this? Up to 16% of patients with bicarb experience a blood pH greater than 7.45 leading to side effects such as increased lactate production, hypocalcemia and decreased cardiac contractility. Monitoring and research needs that are there is the importance to strict lab and blood gas monitoring during bicarb infusion to emphasize the side effects. The recent meta-analysis highlighted the lack of robust data on these effects in critical ill patients. So we need further studies. So gastric losses. So physiological acid base balance in the GI tract is that the, the GI tract typically maintains the balance by exchanging strong ions into different parts of the digestive tracts. So traditional approach of acute colonic diarrhea can lead to metabolic acidosis due to the GI bicarb loss. The Stewart approach says that the acute diarrhea, the intestinal fluid passed too quickly for proper processing preventing the reabsorption of the sodium which contributes to this metabolic acidosis. So soda bicarb infusion can be used to compensate for this sodium loss which is occurring in the GI tract rather than to give the bicarb. In lactic acidosis, the mechanism is that lactic acidosis, the acidosis is produced due to the increase in the strong anion, that is the lactate. Traditional approach involves decreasing the pH, improving the pH by giving the bicarb. The debate on bicarb therapy is that some argue against using intravenous bicarb for lactic acidosis, while sepsis campaign advises against bicarb infusion when the pH is greater than 7.15 but it makes no recommendation if the pH is less than 7.15. Clinical studies by the way have shown that 36 septic patients is a single study, single center study, 36 septic patients with lactic acidosis with pH of less than 7.3, the bicarb infusion did not affect the shock reversal time or the hospital mortality or shorten the ICU stay. Copper et al found no improvement in the cardiac output or cardiovascular response in this group of patients. And Matthew et al showed no difference in the hemodynamic parameters between soda bicarb and sodium chloride in lactic acidosis patients. Now, mortality association, some studies suggest that bicarb infusion may be associated with increased mortality in lactic acidosis. Lee et al in 2015 compared survivors and non-survivors in septic group with lactic acidosis receiving bicarb. Non-survivors had a lower pH and higher PCO2 in 48 hours despite similar bicarb infusions. Now, metformin-induced lactic acidosis is one of the frequent causes. Although soda bicarb could theoretically be useful, studies have shown no positive effect of this. So we can conclude that the effectiveness of the bicarb therapy in reducing mortality and improving hemodynamics in lactic acidosis, even with a pH of less than 7.2, remains unproven. AKI. AKI is a heterogeneous clinical syndrome with various definitions and causes in the ICU. 
the metabolic acidosis in the ICU, the traditional approach is because of the increased urinary bicarb excretion. So the Stewart approach says that the AKI, the acidosis is multifactorial, influenced by the hyperchloremia, the retention of unmeasured anions that is citrates, acetate and sulfate and hyperphosphatemia. The use of soda bicarb in this condition despite the controversy is often used to neutralize the acidosis. In 2017, um, Cochrane meta-analysis found no RCT supporting the use of bicarb in AKI patients. A recent finding though, in subgroup of AKI with soda bicarb for patients with septic metabolic acidosis, 28 mortality was better if the patient received soda bicarb compared to the control group. This outcome may be linked to lower chloride load in the soda bicarb as high chloride was associated with negative outcomes. An observational study by Zhang et al. in 836 patients of AKI receiving bicarb, no overall survival benefit was seen except in patients who are septic with AKI. Bicarb therapy did not improve survival in subgroup with severe acidemia and pancreatitis. Regarding the guidelines, the French expert guideline for managing metabolic acidosis that is severe less than 7.2, moderate to severe renal failure through more, uh, recommends to consider bicarb in this group of patients. Regarding contrast induced nephropathy, the incidence is around 1 to 50 percent depending on the patient's risk factor and the type of contrast used. In critically ill, the incidence is higher, around 20 percent, with various factors contributing. The pathophysiology is that its exact mechanism is not understood, but it causes some kind of renal ischemia and direct tubular cell toxicity. The high osmolar Contrast agents are more nephrotoxic compared to the ones who have lesser osmolarity. Hypoxia can promote the renal damage. Regarding the role of bicarb, it may help to prevent the damage by raising the pH and could reduce the production of free radicals. Now, clinical studies though have been mostly done in non-critical aid patients found no significant difference of uh, using soda bicarb. Regarding critical ill patients, the international consensus on prevention and management of AKI suggests bicarb may be considered to prevent uh, uh, contrast induced nephropathy in critically ill patients, though the, there is no real evidence to support that. Regarding the studies, the valid T et al., the multicentric RCT involving 320 critically ill patients found no difference in bicarb or sodium chloride. In retrospective study found that intravenous soda bicarb before and after contrast did not reduce the incidence of CIN. Uh, regarding its use in uh, cardiac surgery, AKI is a common feature of cardiac surgery incidence ranging from 3 to 52 percent. AKI increases the need for RRT and is associated with high mortality. The causative factors being the hypoperfusion, the ischemia reperfusion injury, erythrocyte damage, hemolysis and the generation of free radicals. The cardiopulmonary bypass can lead to hemolysis and release of these free radicals and hemoglobin producing the renal impairment. Regarding the role of soda backup, the potential benefits are there. It may slow the production of free radicals, reduce the conversion of hemoglobin to methemoglobin and prevent the formation of tubular casts. Regarding clinical studies, Hasse et al. found that bicarb treatment during the first 24 hours post-surgery reduced the incidence of post-operative creatinine increase in high-risk patients. Observation studies show lower incidence of post-operative AKI in patients who receive perioperative bicarb. And there is a conflicting evidence because several RCTs have found that bicarb did not significantly reduce the AKI. Meta-analysis though reported that the urinal alkalization with intravenous bicarb did not reduce the incidence of cardiac surgery induced AKI. The current recommendation is routine use of bicarb is not recommended to prevent uh, cardiac surgery induced AKI. Uh, the effectiveness of bicarb uh, may vary depending on various factors, making it routine would be uncertain. Regarding the liver transplant, the incidence of AKI in liver transplant is around 70 to 95 percent. The risk factors being prolonged rough ischemia time, massive intraoperative transfusions, immunosuppressants and pre existing diseases. The uh, role of soda bicarb in the intraoperative use is used to manage the metabolic acidosis during the transplant which is often caused by large infusions of chloride rich crystalloid fluids and lactate accumulation during the anhepatic phase. The Stewart approach says that highlights the complex acidosis due to low strong ion difference and high weak acid concentrations. Now the clinical findings though, the Wenberg et al. the RCT found no difference in intraoperative bicarb versus normal saline. Bicarb did not significantly impact the hemodynamic parameters or the pH after reperfusion compared to restrictive 
normal saline strategy. Another trial found that bicarb attenuated post-op metabolic acidosis but did not change the outcomes. Coming to the physiological impact, the intraoperative bicarb can rapidly affect the hemodynamics due to its influence of intravascular volume and osmolarity. It acts as a buffer at low pH. The sodium remains extracellular, increasing the intravascular osmolarity and causing the volume shift. A rapid infusion of the soda bicarb results in transient rise in the pH, pCO2 and sodium levels, which but much of it is quickly converted to carbon dioxide and excreted renally. So to summarize, in ARDS, respiratory acidosis don't give, there is negative effects. Uh, it will reduce the arterial blood pH and cardiac output. It will co cause the paradoxical intracellular acidosis. Regarding GI loss, you can give it, but it is mostly given for the replacing the sodium that is getting lost. Regarding lactic acidosis, we mostly have negative effects. So bicarb may contrast the cardiovascular effect of acidemia but did not improve the outcome. So it is not really recommended even if the pH is less than 7.2. Uh, though it can have some positive physiological effects but the paradoxical acidosis could be a potential risk over here. So coming to AKI, uh, there are positive effects. It can limit the physiological damage due to the pH. It can help in some prevention of AKI. There are some studies and it reduces the radical Free radical formation slows the conversion of hemoglobin to methemoglobin. Coming finally to the liver transplant, there are mixed effects, can be nephroprotective but then we have mixed literature on this. Intraoperative administration did not really give harm or benefit. So we need to see what is happening.